Hi, uh, I'm Mohamed Moti from the Sorbonne University and Saint Antoine Hospital in Paris. And it is uh, my great pleasure uh, to be with you today as part of uh, this uh, lovely masterclass. For this session, I've been asked to uh, address uh, uh, some of the issues uh, we have faced uh, uh, during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, uh, in the field and of the management of multiple myeloma. Here are my uh, disclosures. Let me start first by highlighting the importance of the risk of COVID-19 infection in patient with multiple myeloma. And in order to highlight this, I wanted to share with you uh, a clinical case. This is unfortunately uh, one of our first uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, infections in multiple myeloma in my department uh, during the first wave. So this is a 63-year-old gentleman uh, with myeloma diagnosed in 2017. The patient received transplant. He is transplant eligible, so he received standard induction with uh, VRD, bortezomib, lenalidomide, dexamethasone, four cycles, achieved VGPR. We performed the stem cell collection. Uh, we performed the transplant. Patient was in VGPR and he was then receiving uh, maintenance with the lenalidomide. The patient uh, relapsed two years after transplant, and he was included uh, in a protocol, the uh, Ikema protocol. This is the combination of isetuximab, carfizumab, and dexamethasone. And since then, I think uh, we have already had the communications about the results of this trial. And he actually achieved CR. In April 2020, the patient presented with pneumonia. Uh, he needed very quickly ICU intubation. And despite uh, the treatment with tocilizumab and, of course, supportive care, he uh, died uh, uh, a couple of weeks later. So you can see how difficult, how tough, and how quick uh, this can be. So uh, this is uh, why uh, very rapidly uh, we uh, have summarized uh, our experience of COVID-19 in hematologic uh, diseases because we wanted to alert the broader community about the risk in uh, this uh, population. And we have published very quickly uh, our first 25 patients with COVID-19 infection. And what you can see, and I have underlined this in red here, that out of 25 patients, the majority were multiple myeloma patients. And there is a good explanation for this because multiple myeloma patients are highly immunosuppressed by the disease itself, because the immune response is impaired. But multiple myeloma patients are also relatively elderly patients, frail patients with comorbidities. And also the treatments we give to multiple myeloma are inducing a high level of immunosuppression. And this is about uh, dexamethasone. And we know very well that the high dosage of dexamethasone is extremely deleterious. And this is why the mortality rate uh, of COVID-19 in multiple myeloma is uh, significantly high, around 30%. And this has been confirmed now in studies from Spain, from Italy, from the UK. You can appreciate here, for instance, in this very large series, uh, uh, patients who are elderly who have hematological malignancies and especially myeloma is highly represented, unfortunately, are the patient with a high risk of COVID-19 severe infection. So this was a very important uh, message uh, that uh, uh, needs to be clearly communicated and highlighted. 
Now, having said this, uh, what was and what is the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the management of these patients? And since the early days of the pandemic, I think uh, most hematology centers in Europe and worldwide and in my department, uh, we have established some objectives, some goals. First objective is to protect the highly immunosuppressed myeloma patient, because I've just mentioned the high risk of mortality in these patients. But at the same time, we wanted to maintain a high standard of multiple myeloma care. We wanted to continue to deliver the optimal treatments for these patients. And in parallel, you wanted to protect your healthcare professionals because you need these highly skilled manpower to deliver the optimal care to your myeloma uh, patient. So the practical questions uh, we have faced were about whether we should postpone frontline auto-transplant for myeloma patients. Because uh, the problem with auto, as you know, is about the aplasia, and that is further worsening the risk. But also some patient during auto may require ICU bed. And the ICU is extremely busy with the COVID-19 patient. So you have to think about how uh, to handle this and what are the alternative uh, options. Also, stem cell mobilization can be an issue because you have uh, to come frequently uh, to the hospital. And then, of course, circulation would increase the uh, risk of transmission of uh, the virus. Also, you have patients receiving maintenance therapy, and probably this is contributing to the immune suppression. So should we modify this? And immediately, we also uh, acknowledge the deleterious role of dexamethasone. And the question is how to handle this. Should we reduce the dosage? Should we discontinue? And in which patient? We also know that many myeloma patients uh, receive biphosphonate and they come frequently to the hospital. How to handle the use? Of course, we were all asking the question whether we can do something in a prophylactic uh, uh, way to uh, protect myeloma patient against COVID-19. But as you may guess, this is very tricky because uh, it is now uh, not still not yet well established. Of course, the management of these patients, but last but not least, how are we going to handle the clinical research protocols? Because clinical research protocols uh, uh, do require a lot of visits to the hospital. And again, lots of circulation, lots of traveling. And more circulation, more traveling, definitely the risk of infection uh, is very high. This is why we and others uh, have clearly uh, thought and published some recommendations to answer these questions. When it comes to autologous stem cell transplantation, uh, we thought that we can postpone the procedure, especially by increasing the number of cycles of induction. And we knew that there is no harm to the patient because actually in terms of overall survival at the end, that may not create a problem. Also, we know that by giving more cycles of induction, actually, you're deepening the response. So again, there is no harm. It's more about benefit. However, in the high-risk cytogenetics patient, we thought that this should not be delayed. So you can see how this has been personalized. Standard risk, you would increase the induction regimens. In the high-risk, no uh, no delay. And of course, immediately uh, we established the practice, we recommended the practice 
that we need to test frequently uh, these patients. And when it comes to the uh, transplant uh, approach and the way to handle transplant safely in this environment, uh, the EBMT, the European Group for uh, Society for Blood and Marrow Transplantation, very quickly uh, uh, delivered and published uh, some consensus recommendations that were adopted, I think, worldwide. Uh, the prevention policies, how to manage the staff, because of course uh, you're worried about the patient, but also you want to keep your staff uh, uh, in uh, action uh, and of course avoid uh, lots of sickness and infections. We uh, had also recommendations about the outpatient visits and visitors, because again, the message is that the virus is circulating with people. So we had to protect the patient. This is why we needed to take some tough measures, very difficult from a psychological point of view, because patient uh, would become a little bit uh, isolated in the different department. But definitely we had to unite forces and deliver uh, these uh, uh, messages and these recommendations. When it comes to the steroids, especially dexamethasone, I think we have taken the decision and there was relatively good consensus that you need to consider reducing the dosage or even discontinuing, especially in the patient who are in excellent response or even complete remission. And then we would say, uh, well, these patients, maybe you can avoid dexamethasone. And it's a way to avoid further increasing the immune suppression. And actually, uh, this requirement mandated by the pandemic proved to be a good bet because we know now that actually maybe we are using a lot of dexamethasone in multiple myeloma patients and maybe the patient don't need such high dosage because dexamethasone is a major risk for complications in the patient and our patients are suffering a lot from dexamethasone. So I think this is a positive aspect of the COVID-19 pandemic where now we are able to rethink the dexamethasone dosage. When it comes to the outpatient visits, uh, we had to be very strict to protect these patients. It's about the benefit and risk ratio to avoid you know, transmission of the virus. But we also uh, pushed in order to push pharmacists to deliver multiple, uh, several weeks and months of treatment. We favored, we pushed to favor home hospitalization, home care, and whenever possible, switching from IV or subcute to oral uh, uh, treatments. And when it comes to bifosphonate, actually home administration or even delaying or temporary interruption uh, were uh, recommended. For clinical trials, of course, those who are really uh, already enrolled and in need, I would say business as usual, we continue. However, for those patients, uh, for the follow-up, for instance, it was clear that you have to open for teleconsultation, avoiding the circulation. You had to deliver at home the different uh, treatments. So everything has been recommended in a way to uh, decrease the risk of uh, infection. And I think uh, these measures were rapidly adopted and they proved to be quite successful because the incidence of the infection decreased. And that's really a good news. When it comes now to the management of the patient uh, uh, with myeloma and who unfortunately, uh, despite the different measures uh, developed a COVID-19 uh, infection, well, obviously uh, the European Myeloma Network published some uh, guidelines. They are summarized here. And this actually at the end of the day is more about uh, symptomatic management because we don't have a curative uh, treatment yet for the COVID-19 infection. Although now we know that vaccine is highly recommended and we do recommend vaccination to everybody. Although the immune system of a myeloma patient 
uh, is more uh, fragile and not all patients will respond very well to the vaccine, but definitely uh, vaccination is highly recommended. Otherwise, the management in case of a severe uh, COVID-19 infection is similar, I would say, to uh, other patients uh, with COVID-19. And of course, you have to hold the myeloma therapy while if you are struggling with a severe COVID-19 uh, infection. Also, uh, and uh, uh, I would like to conclude uh, on this, we know uh, today we have more and more knowledge about uh, uh, the COVID-19 infection, and we know it shares some similarities with the pathophysiology we know in different hematologic malignancies about clotting, about the uh, CRS, you know, the cytokine release syndrome and so on. So actually, uh, we in the hematology and myeloma field, uh, uh, we were able uh, to connect, you know, the dots. And that has been uh, extremely very uh, useful uh, to uh, all of us. So in summary, uh, as you uh, noticed, I think this COVID-19 pandemic, when it comes to uh, multiple myeloma patients, but to hematology patient management in general, significantly impacted clinical practice day to day. We needed to uh, establish big adjustment. They are already now implemented in hospitals and clinic. And depending on where you are, whether you are in, still in a wave or you are in a sort of a post-pandemic, definitely some of uh, uh, these measures will continue. For instance, teleconsultation is now here to stay, and this is good news and uh, much enjoyed by many patients to avoid traveling, to avoid transport, public transport, etc. cetera. Uh, also, we should not forget about the dissemination of knowledge. And this is really uh, great news. Uh, I, I remember during this COVID-19 pandemic, thanks to all of these digital and virtual tools, we were able to have lots of uh, meeting with patient advocacy group and you know, to keep the contact and to explain uh, what's ongoing and to reassure because obviously uh, what happened is that uh, the pandemic generated a lot of anxiety lots of fear. But for us also in the healthcare uh, system, the healthcare professionals, we have uh, adjusted our approaches. Uh, we have now our multidisciplinary meetings being uh, handled in a virtual fashion. Of course, this is good news because it allows more people uh, to meet and discuss the cases. So you have uh, to see, and this is my philosophy to be always optimistic, to see uh, some uh, good uh, news. And for instance, when it comes to the uh, digital and rapid spreading of the knowledge, we immediately organized some webinars. This is one example of the webinar we organized very early with Professor Marie V. Mateos, and it has been uh, viewed by thousands and thousands of people on YouTube, but definitely we needed to connect all together. And we are, we need to be thankful and we need to acknowledge all of these digital tools. So as you may guess, this has been difficult. It didn't finish yet. We need to continue to be careful. We need to get vaccinated. We need to spread the word, uh, but definitely this, is, uh, this pandemic has been a challenge like no other. Thank you very much for your attention.